to seeing all the wonderful uh, things that God's doing uh, with our people and through our people. So it's been a great uh, reward to be here. Uh, my wife, uh, Wendy, and my three boys are members here, been members for almost five years. So uh, community group leader, I'm about to go teach from the book of James here in just a moment in my community group. So we're going to solve the uh, works and faith debate once and for all. So if you want to hear that, come across. Uh, but that's enough about me. So uh, let's talk about some announcements here, the great things that God's doing here in our community. First thing is the women's breakfast this coming Saturday across the street at the cafe. So we're going to get started at 8 a.m., uh, $5. Bring $5. Enjoy some uh, chicken biscuits, I believe. So good time to come. Uh, next one we have is Checkpoint. So Checkpoint, how many of us have 9 or 10-year-olds? Any of us? Any of us? A few? So here's a revelation. They are halfway out of the house. So this is a point to kind of come in and allow Sandy and the uh, wonderful children's ministry to teach us how to disciple our kids for this remaining time while they're at home. So that is in two Sundays from now, right after the 1045 service. So we'll come to that. And finally, uh, two weeks, two Sundays, two, two Wednesdays from now, we're going to have night of worship. So it'll be a time to come and uh, worship the Lord through our uh, singing. It'll be a great time, 6.30 to 7.30. There will be food before, so please come out and uh, worship with, with our team, our wonderful musicians and all the talented people we have. And I'll turn it over to them. Hey, good morning. Hey, why don't we stand? Uh, we're gonna worship this morning. My name is Stephen Patasic. This is my wife Amanda over here. We got a great team for you this morning, and uh, we're really just excited to just enter into the Lord's presence here and just seek him as we pursue how to pray and how to seek his face.
just the magnification of who you are in our lives, God, in our awareness, presence, and here you are. See? 
recognize that you are the way maker. You're a miracle worker. And we also, in the same hand, hold the reality that many times we don't see that you're working. Sometimes you don't work in the way that we want you to, ways that we would prefer you to. Jesus, you led the way for us in terms of how to handle that when, when you wept. You led the way to tears when we needed to cry. You led the way to sorrow when we needed to weep. And so this morning in a room of this size, we just recognize that not all of us are on a mountaintop, that not all of us are in a place of joy and excitement and so we we come alongside our brothers and sisters who are lamenting who are grieving especially in the midst of this global pandemic that we've experienced and brothers and sisters there's language in the scriptures for us there's language throughout the psalms that talk about how we can come to God with our disappointments and with the realities that not everything is perfect, not everything is the way we would want it to be. And so this morning, I wanna read out of Psalm 13. The first time I'm gonna read it over you, and then the next time I'm gonna ask that we all say it together as a lament, whether we're lamenting or not. Scripture says that we rejoice with those who rejoice and we weep with those who weep. So hear the words of the psalmist this morning. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O oh Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. And lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I'm shaken. But I've trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. So let's all say that together. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall the enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O oh Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. out together in peace.
Father, would you be the one to carry us through yet again, to remind us of the deep truths of not just your word, but our history. As we just prayed before, Lord, we have trusted in your steadfast love. You have proven yourself faithful, and you do not change. And so would you meet each and every one of us exactly where we are today and draw us closer still to you. But we choose today to yet again put our faith and our trust in the one who is always trustworthy. And we lift you high this morning, Lord. In your name we pray. And we all said, amen. 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 You can be seated. And thank you to, are we all good? Yes? Or one more song? Wait, one more song? Yeah, after the offering. <laughs> oh, after the offering. I came up early. Here we go. Let's do one more. How about that? Yeah. I think Okay, we'll do the offering now oh, yeah, while we're doing that. Hey, we're going to continue our, uh, our worship through giving. So if you look to your left, my right, you will find an offering basket quickly before it gets any more awkward. Do it now. Do it now, people. Pass it to the left, okay? Or actually, you're, you're right, my left. I'm going to get off the stage now. There we go. I'll be here all week. I don't even work here. Shame. 
Amen. I want to thank the Potassics and Jenny and the whole team for leading us in worship today. Can we give another round of applause for leading us in worship this morning? Thank you all. Hayes and Bethany were able to get a break, and so we are glad that they are here with us today. Let's get this over here. Hey, listen, we do want to say a quick uh, word of prayer for all of those who can't really be here right now. Uh, what you guys may or may not know is that every Sunday morning here at the Mount Laurel campus, there's still a good 100, 150 people of our folks who are worshiping right now uh, through that camera there in the back. I know Miss Christine Ladshaw is watching this morning. I know a bunch of folks are watching this morning. I want to make sure they know that we have not forgotten about them. Uh, and give them a chance also to pray for us. And so we're just going to take a moment to just pray for our congregation. And so if you know of some of those folks who still might be homebound or not able to come back and worship with us in person yet for whatever reason, would you just begin to kind of put their faces in your minds and let's lift them up for a moment before the Lord. And if you're at home, I hope that you will just think about the folks you miss. Uh, not just folks you can see through the camera, but the folks that you go to community group with or you haven't been able to, to really fellowship with. I want you to lift them up as well. We are still a congregation, even if we can't fully gather in one room just yet. But we want to take that moment today. So bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment. And Heavenly Father, we are glad for the community that you have built among us. The family of faith that you have created. And Lord, in the midst of uh, almost two years now of... Uh, an unforeseen struggle. Lord, it's been hard to feel as connected as we have before. But our connection in your spirit hasn't wavered a bit. And so, Lord, would you continue to bind us together? Lord, whether we're watching today online, whether we're right here worshiping in the room, where we're about to worship here in the next hour, Lord, would you continue to knit us together as your people in this time, in this place? And Father, do we do long for the day when we can physically gather together all as one people. We pray that you would bring it. But until then, by your spirit, would you remind us of our connection in you? Would you truly bind us together in your love? And Father, would you continue to, to prompt us that we might pray for one another and lift one another up until that day we can physically see one another all together in one place. Lord, we long for that day, but we are so grateful with the connection that we have in you. In your name we pray. And we all said, amen. Amen. Hey, grab your Bibles if you will. Let's go to James chapter 4. James 4 is where we're going to begin today. As we're heading into a new sermon series called Draw Near. And we started last week with this command, an invitation from the Lord where he says, draw near to me. And then a promise, and God will draw near to us. And so we're going to take this whole season to heed that command, to honor that invitation, and say, I, we want to be drawing near to the Lord through prayer. And as we walk through this season, we'll be giving you some new tools to use in your prayer life, but I challenge all of us, whether it's a, a personal quiet time in the morning, whether it's different prayers throughout the day, whether it be gatherings for prayer in your community groups, let us make prayer a priority as we seek to draw near to God. And we'll look at that in James chapter 4, starting at verse 7 in just a second. James chapter 4, verse 7 is where we'll begin in just a second. While you're turning there, let me ask you a question. How many of you have an allergy of some kind? Anybody who's got an allergy? Anybody? Yes, yes, raise your hand. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of us. Isn't that interesting? I don't know about you, but growing up, I just didn't hear a lot about people with allergies. I knew some folks with allergies, but it seemed to be the exception, whereas today, it seems to be the rule. And maybe that's just because we're more aware or science has moved forward, but it seems like there's just a lot of us who have allergies of some kind, and they can affect us in different ways. Uh, we've been dealing with that in the Robinson household a few years ago. We discovered that Allison had uh, an allergy to both gluten and to dairy. Uh, I didn't know what gluten even was. I had to look it up. Uh, it's wheat. Uh, and so we just we were trying to actually solve a, another illness, and we're trying different things, and actually just stumbled across this. But as we pulled wheat and dairy out of her diet, some amazing things happened. Uh, stomach issues that she had had her entire life just kind of evaporated. There were other things that we just kind of dealt with and just assumed, hey, this is just normal. This is where we are that all of a sudden began to, to change and get better. I mean, it was, it was kind of remarkable. They just taking a couple of things out of our diet could have, have that kind of effect on us. And remember, this is something she lived with her entire life. We just did not know. 
And, and so seeing all these positive changes, this is now something we have to watch out for. So when we go out to restaurants, we really have to be careful and say, hey, what is in this? We read a lot of ingredient labels. We have to be careful when folks give us food or this and that just to, to make sure that these things don't sneak in because they sneak in in ways that you might not be aware of. And, and that's just kind of part of our routine. And some of you guys know what that's like because you've got allergies of your own. Maybe you have a peanut allergy, or you've got a child or a grandchild with a, a peanut allergy. Maybe it's an environmental allergy, like to, to cats or to dogs or to something else in the environment. Maybe it's a medication allergy, where you really can't take this certain thing. It does things to your body it doesn't do to other people's bodies. And, and when you find that out, on the one hand, it's great because it, it can solve a lot of those negative effects in your life. But on the other hand, there's a constant vigilance that has to be put into place you got to watch out for that. You can't just walk around life assuming that everything's fine. You have to constantly being aware, be aware that those things can intrude if you are not careful. Now, some people look at me and say, well, Adam, listen, I'm sure that's really hard for Allison, but, but you don't have that allergy. You can still eat what you want, right? And, I'm, and that's true. It's much harder on her than it is on me. I, I don't have to, to, to guard my diet like she does, but... The question I've been thinking of since then is this, is like, what are the allergies I still don't know about? We spent all this time not even knowing that this was a problem in her life, so what are the things that are going on in my life or our life, what are the allergies I still don't know about that are affecting me, that are holding me back, that are hurting me, that I still aren't even aware of? What if we all have some sort of an allergy, maybe not physical, but spiritual? What if you had an allergy that was holding you back and you didn't even know it? If that were the case, uh, we'd be suffering, and we wouldn't even know that there was a problem to be solved. We would have just gotten used to some sort of a status quo and miss out on all that God has in store for us. James is describing something similar for us in James chapter 4. We're going to read the passage that we read last week in James chapter 4, verse 7. Listen to what he says here. He says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Last week, we, we learned this, that, that there's this invitation to draw near to God, but we ought to have a posture of humility as we do so. We humble ourselves before the Lord. But it bears repeating that all of these things that James says here, he is saying to believers. He's not saying this to lost people. He's not saying this to people who are far from God. The people hearing this letter read would have been people who had gathered for worship in a church. So he's speaking to the faithful. He is speaking to people who know the Lord. And he says, listen, we still, even as believers, have issues. We have problems with being double-minded, with being sinners, so much so that we can be laughing when we ought to be mourning. We, we can go about thinking things are fine when they actually aren't. We got allergies. There are propensities inside of us, even as believers, that we must be aware of. Because if we're not, they literally will hold us back or, or shipwreck us in our faith. And this is something we constantly have to be vigilant about as believers. Even when we are walking with the Lord, there are tendencies inside of us. There are pulls inside of us that will draw us away from the Lord if we are not careful. Look what the writer of Hebrews says, uh, a writer who also tells us to, to draw near to the Lord. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1 says this, Therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. You ever felt like you've drifted from the Lord? I wonder how many of us could say as a part of our story, man, I used to walk with the Lord. Maybe I came to faith as a, as a child or a teenager and then I went to college and I drifted. Or there's a period of my life where I walked with the Lord and everything was great, and then there was that decade where I drifted. 
There's all kinds of things and, and pain that can, can, can kind of emerge in the midst of a drifting season. This is not something that's true for some of us. This is a temptation for all of us. This is the natural bent and propensity even for us as believers. Are we saved? Yes. Are we in danger of losing our salvation? No. But do we still struggle with a sin that lives inside of our body? Yes. We have to be aware of this at all points. James really points out two ways that this reveals itself. First off, he says, purify your hearts, you double-minded, in verse 8. This is a very interesting word that he uses here, double-minded. James most likely coins this term. It doesn't really show up anywhere else. But literally what it says in the Greek is double-souled. You are too souled what does he mean by that? Well, you can't actually have two souls living inside of you, which is why we get the translation double-minded. It's living in such a way that I've got two different kinds of person living inside of me. On the one hand, I love the Lord. I delight in his ways. I want to follow after him. And in certain areas of my life, I'm going to follow after him. But in another area of my life, we reject that. And we seek after other things. And we seek after selfishness or whatever we want with, with disregard to the Lord and what he would say about things. And so I honestly do love love the Lord in one part of my life and I don't in another, that's double-souled, double-minded. And it's a temptation for all of us, something we have to be aware of. Second off, he just says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Even as believers, we all struggle. Even as believers, we will fail. Even as believers, we have to recognize that God is still working on us. There's a consistent process of sanctification that is happening inside of us. We have our justification in Christ, but this process is now unfolding through a sanctification, a cleansing of who we are, which means that even in the present, we are all struggling with sin. And the pathway of addressing this, the pathway of staying aware of this process is prayer. It's why James will say, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. As we feel this tug in our souls in whatever way that manifests in your life, there's an antidote. Daily, persistent, Christ-centered, spirit-filled, prayer keeps us close with the Lord as He continues to grow and change us as we walk forward in Him. This is why prayer is so important. It's not a, an add-on. It's not a luxury. It's not just a, a resource that's there in a pinch. This is what we need daily for everything that you and I encounter. We ought to constantly, continually be drawing near to God as He draws near to us. And so we're going to look more specifically at prayer and how that really works out in our life. And this morning we're going to be looking at the Lord's Prayer. So flip over, if you will, now to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6 is where we're going to be today, where the Lord gives us probably one of the most famous prayers in all of Scripture. Matthew chapter 6, we'll start in verse 5. I'll put that up there in just uh, right there in a moment. You can look at that, but if you have it there in your copy of God's Word, you can look at that there as well. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is teaching us about prayer, but he starts talking about it and he says, listen, some of you are, are a little misguided when it comes to prayer. Last week in James, we found out it's possible to pray wrongly, which seemed odd to us. But here Jesus is going to point some of those things out. Look what he says in Matthew 6 verse 5. He says, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they've received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, don't keep up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Don't be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, and you can say it along with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And no, we did not cut it off early. Uh, I know for some of us there's a couple lines after that. Those are probably not original to the text there. But here Jesus himself teaches us how to pray. 
He gives specific instruction on what we are to do. And he's doing so because we all, even the Pharisees, all of us, we have this propensity to to change it, to mold it into into something in our own image. And he gives two examples of that here. In verse 5, he says, first off, you don't need to make this all about yourself. Don't make prayer all about yourself. He talks about these Pharisees, these hypocrites. He says, listen, these guys love to pray. Specifically, they love to pray on street corners and in synagogues where everybody can see just how spiritual they are. So everybody can see that, man, listen to their words, man. They've got the flowery language. They've got their theology down, man. They, 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 they know what they're doing, man. They're professionals at this, and they look incredibly spiritual. And Jesus says, if that's what you're after, then you've already got it. Prayer is not about being seen by others. It's about interaction with our Father. It's about drawing near to the Heavenly Father. Now, the Pharisees, I imagine, might protest. They say, well, hey, can't we do, can't we do both? I mean, look, I love the Lord. I, I'm trying to pray to Him, but I also need to lead the people. I need to show them how this is done. I need to, to give them a good example. So can I just kill two birds with one stone? I mean, if I do love the Lord and I'm trying to honor him, can't I do that in public and and make all of that work? I mean, I'm I'm doing two things, but can I do two things at once? Well, you can, just not very well. Imagine taking your sports-averse wife out to a sports bar for your date night and saying, hey, listen, you wanted to go out for a date. Let's go out for a date. Let's go to the sports bar. I know you hate sports and TVs, but there's only 42 of them there in the restaurant. It'll be fine. And he said, well, I don't know what the problem is. Look, that she wanted a date night. She got a date night. I wanted to watch the game. I, watch the game. I t- killed two birds with one stone. You tell me how that goes for you, all right? You have technically accomplished your goals, but not very well. Look, you're, you're denying a relationship when you're trying to use something in multiple ways. Prayer is not something to be used like this. That, that is literally an example of being double-minded. I doubt that the Pharisees hated God. I bet to a man they would say that they didn't, truly. They're not trying to deceive other people. They just wanted both. They said, no, I love the Lord, and I also want to be seen as spiritual. I want to look good. I want to succeed. And so, can't I do both? You see the pull? We love the Lord, but there's this other thing pulling on us, and that kind of poisons our Prayer life, we tend to sometimes make prayer about ourselves. Secondly, we just, uh, we, we kind of make it all just about words. Look at verse 7. It says, and don't pray like the hypocrites. They, they think that because they just say so many words that they're going to be heard. That if they just say enough in the right way, then I'm going to do what they want me to do. For these folks, they, they, they come to the Lord and say, say I'm just going to pray for hours. I'm going I'm to pray passionately. I'm going to pray in a certain way. I'm going I'm to pray all these things. I'm going to say whichever you think I, whatever thing you think uh, I think you want to hear. I'm, I'm just going to talk and talk and pray and pray and pray under the assumption that if I just wear you down, you'll give me what I want. Do you see how impersonal that is? God has stopped being a loving heavenly father. He's now just a tree to cut down. Man, if I just keep whacking at this thing, if I just keep swinging at this thing, sooner or later it'll fall and I'll get what I want. He's just a wall to be, to be tunneled through. Man, if I just keep digging, if I just keep asking him, if I keep wearing him down, sooner or later I get through and I get what I want. We've turned God into a machine. We've turned him into a system. We've forgotten the fact that he's our loving, saving, heavenly father. And so even though these people started in the right vein, and even though they might have started with proper motives, that pull, those those spiritual allergies, they've, they've forgotten about them, and they just assume, well, if I just pray, it's all fine, right? And they end up kind of missing the point. And so what Jesus does is, is he teaches us how we need to pray. And that is what Jesus is doing here. Most likely, this is not the first time that the disciples have heard this. Look at Luke chapter 11, different gospel, but you hear in a different spot in the story. Now, Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, and then you get the Lord's prayer. It's the same thing. Jesus would actually teach the same thing in multiple places and on multiple occasions. 
So the first time the disciples heard the Lord's Prayer was most likely not at the Sermon on the Mount. They had been hanging out with Jesus for a while now, and they would watch him pray. And one of them just says, Jesus, so what do we do? How do you pray? Teach us to pray. And so he does, but, but as he does so, we, we learn some things about the Lord's Prayer. We learn about what's really going on here. I think the first thing we need to recognize, though, about what Jesus is saying here is that this is, this is, not, a, um, this is not a form prayer. When Jesus teaches them to pray, he's not saying, well, here it is. If you just say this prayer, this is the best I got. This is, this is the one. Just keep saying this and you'll be fine. That's not what he intends. You may say, well, how do you know that, Adam? How, he teaches us. He, he said it multiple places. He gave us these words. Isn't this the form that we're supposed to use? Actually, no. Think about that Luke 11 context. If all Jesus was doing was sitting around and just mumbling the same prayer over and over and over and over and over again, there's no need to ask him to teach you. You just sit and listen. You memorize it, and then you join in. There's no reason for Jesus to teach you anything. Furthermore, when you see Jesus praying in other parts of Scripture, he doesn't pray this way. He doesn't even use the, the same kind of format. Look at John 17. It's something we would call the high priestly prayer. It's the night before the crucifixion. We have an entire chapter that is just Jesus praying. And it doesn't use this format. So Jesus also would pray in different ways. So when we're looking at the Lord's Prayer, as famous as it is, the, the goal here is not simply to, to give us a, a form to use. It's a base on which everything else is built. There's a difference there. Here, check this out. I've been working on this for a while. I'm going to blow your minds, all right? Check this out. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. H-I-J-K-L-M-N-O-P, Q-R-S-T-U-V, W-X-Y, and Z. Hold your applause. <laughs> Wait, no applause? Really? Seriously? Dude, now I know my ABCs. Next time, won't you sing with me? Well, you're not impressed? Are you not entertained? Come on. Well, so, well, Adam, you're a grown man. It's not terribly impressive. Every grown man ought to know the ABCs. You learn those when you're a kid. The ABCs are not impressive, but they're necessary. Why? It's the base upon which everything else is built. Every word we say in the English language comes out of them. Everything we build comes out of the English alphabet. You've got to have the ABCs. And look, it is impressive when my daughter tells me the ABCs. She's three. That is impressive. I am incredibly proud that she can say her ABCs. I am amazed when she can say her ABCs. But in three, four years, I will no longer be amazed. I'm like, going, that was great. That's a great base. But now you got to build on it. Now you got to do something with it. That's what the Lord's Prayer is. It's not a form. He's not saying just say this. It's a base upon which to build everything else. It's a guide to say this then is how, like how you should pray. This is the, the way that you can do it. It is a base upon which we can pray everything. It's a starting point. And yes, memorizing it is great. Saying it out loud is great. That is helpful. But, but the goal is not just to know it. The goal is to really live it out, to, to, to use this as a base to pray everything else. But it's not just a form. This is honestly revolutionary. That may be weird for us to hear because when we hear the Lord's Prayer, it doesn't sound new and revolutionary. It sounds ancient. We're not terribly creedal you know, in our congregation, okay? And so when we hear these things and we say these form prayers, that, that sounds a little bit more ancient, like a calling back to, to the history of the church because this prayer has been around for 2,000 years. But for them hearing it for the very first time, for Jesus to say, this then is how you should pray, this was revolutionary to them. This was not how the Pharisees prayed. This is not what they were expecting. And when you and I join in with the Lord, when we pray like this, it can revolutionize us as well. There's three things I think that this Lord's Prayer does for us. The first is this. The Lord's Prayer draws us close. The Lord's Prayer draws us close. Look at the very first two words in the prayer. He says, Our Father... 
in heaven. Now, again, this sounds very basic for us. We talk about our Heavenly Father all the time. The very phrase you might use in addressing the Lord might be Heavenly Father. That might seem normal to us. This is not normal in Jesus' day. Look throughout the Old Testament. I think there's maybe three, if not four, references to God as Father. It is not normal. This is not how people address the Lord. They call him sovereign. They talk, call him God. They call him Yahweh. They call, he is the, the Lord, but not Father. Go back to Moses, the man who, who talks to God as, as man would talk to a friend. I couldn't find any place where Moses refers to God as his father. What about David, the man after God's own heart? David, who, who pours out his heart in, in prayer and hundreds of prayers recorded in the Psalms and in other places in Scripture. I can't find a single place where he calls God his father. And yet here Jesus comes along, not saying, here's how I pray. He says, here's how you can pray. We can call God our Father. There's an incredible intimacy in that phrase. He's your Father. That when we approach the Lord, we don't approach Him simply as slaves. We don't simply approach Him as worshipers. We get to approach Him as children. Dearly beloved children. When you pray, God looks at you as a father looks at his child. He feels about you and your request as God feels about a beloved child. He said, this is the primary way you need to be thinking about me. This is the way you need to approach God. If you're going to draw near to God, we don't simply draw near to a potentate. We draw near to our father. We draw near to someone who cares about us, who created us, who loves us. And that changes the tenor of our prayers. Before we ever jump into our request, we need to start with the relationship. This is not about making prayer work per se. It's about recognizing it's a relationship with my heavenly father, with someone who loves me. Now, I thought about asking this question of how many of us Think of God as our Father, but I'm not going to ask it because I already know the answer. The answer is yes. The problem is, is that when we use that word Father, it is invariably tied up in our relationship with our earthly father. When we start saying God is our Father, we cannot help but make comparisons and note similarities and differences between our earthly father for good or for ill. Some of us may have great relationships with our father, some of us may not. But regardless, your relationship with your earthly father is going to color your relationship with your heavenly father until you take time to notice those differences. Until you recognize that that is going on in your soul. And it could be that some of our block in prayer is because we're approaching God like we would approach our earthly father. And for some of us, that's easy, and for some of us, that's not. For some of us, that's comforting, and for some of us, that's not. And that can impact your prayer life. And what the Lord is trying to say here is that when you talk to the Lord, you can address Him as your perfect, heavenly Father. Not just the Father you had, for good or for ill. All of us as, as parents are flawed. We do our best. But no parent does that perfectly. Our parents didn't do that perfectly any more than we will. But we have a perfect heavenly father who loves us, who cares for us, who always does the right thing, who always reacts appropriately. A father who we cannot exhaust his love. When we start with the Lord's Prayer, that word right at the beginning just really fixes a lot of things. It pulls us in his direction to say, don't you understand, when you draw near to me, you are drawing near to a loving Father who cares for us. How would it change our prayer life if you knew without a doubt that every single time you prayed, that's the kind of audience you would receive? That that's how you would be accepted before the Lord, not simply as a uh, Johnny come lately uh, as, a, as a, a really good worker, uh, as somebody who's got a lot of potential, but as a son, as a daughter, who is loved and cherished by Heavenly Father, this is how God feels about you. 
He's opening that door saying, you get to pray this. Not 10 years from now when you figure it out, but right now, he's offering that to you. The Lord's prayer draws us close. It reminds us of what this relationship actually is. And so in our prayer life, what if you just centered on that? Before you ever got to a request, what if you just started with that word, Father, Father, Father. It's not a mantra. It's just a challenge to slow down and begin to recognize who you're speaking to, what this relationship is, what's really going on. Let the Lord begin to reveal to you more of his heart and who he is. What if you just said, you're my father. I can address you as father. You call me son. You call me daughter. You're my father. What if before you rush into to prayer and the request, the requests are good, we're going to get to them, but we started with the relationship and say, God, you are our father. The Lord's prayer draws us close. Here's the second thing. The Lord's prayer recenters us. The Lord's prayer recenters us. Look at the next few phrases. It says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. So again, before we ever get into request for daily bread or anything else, it is starting with a recognition of who God is. But more than that, it is a recognition of what reality really is. Of recognizing that, wait a minute, there's a reality, there's a God, and He is bigger than me, our Father. There is a God, there is an authority in life. Even as Father, He's not simply friend, He has Father. He has an authority over me. Wait a minute, there's an authority in my life, and it's not me. There is a God in this universe, and it is not me. Furthermore, our Father in heaven. Okay, wait a minute, there's a heaven. There's a world that I don't see. When I look around, I am not seeing the fullness of reality. There's more going on that I am typically aware of. Hallowed be your name. Wait a minute, you are holy. That's what that word means. You are other. You are different. You are perfect in ways I cannot fully understand. You and I will literally spend eternity understanding what that term means, diving into the beauty, the goodness, the power, the majesty of who God is. We will never get to the end of how hallowed our God is. He is that grand. Your kingdom come. Wait a minute. The most important kingdom in life is not my kingdom. It is your kingdom. Your will be done. The most important will to be done is not my will. It is your will. This is important. Before I ever get to my requests about things, I need to recognize, wait a minute, the most important prayer is, God, your will be done before my will is done. That is a radical shift in our perspective. Because all of us as humans have a tendency to want the entire universe to revolve around us. That's not just you or your neighbor or that person you're thinking about right now, all right? That's all of us. There is a, a nature inside of us. This is that sinfulness, even that double-mindedness. I can't just follow the Lord. No, I've got this, this desire, this pull that, that is constantly pulling me to a place where I want everything to revolve around me. And if we're not aware of that, if we do not check that, we will drift into a place where everything is about us. We all do this. We slowly, over time, simply begin to look at reality in terms of us being the center of everything. I thought about this uh, reading an article uh, earlier this week. Uh, there is an interesting guy in Italy uh, his name is Nicholas Gentile, uh, and he is a fan of the Lord of the Rings. I don't know if you're a fan of the Lord of the Rings. A uh, set of fantasy books written by J.R.R. Tolkien. Uh, they're amazing. They were also made into movies, if you did not know that they were books before that. Uh, but, but super you know, famous, and this guy loves these books so much so that he wants to live in that world. Here's a picture of him. Um, that's Nicholas. <laughs> and he now dresses and lives as a hobbit. Hobbits were kind of the heroes of the story. Uh, they're little tiny guys. He's probably taller than what a hobbit is, and his feet aren't hairy enough. Uh, but this guy says, hey, I want to live as a hobbit. So what he's done is he has bought a piece of land in Italy, and he says, I'm just going to live on this piece of land as a hobbit. This is what I'm going to do. That's how much I love this. He got friends to join him in it. 
Uh, and they live with him out there, and they all dress up in their little costumes and such. And then they're trying to build on this land, like all the buildings from the Shire. That's the place where all the hobbits live. Check this out. Here's Gandalf, and they've built the little hobbit hole, right? Uh, who knows how old that guy is? Uh, but they're building these buildings so they can go back to Nicholas there, uh, if, you, if you will. Uh, so this guy says... Uh, hey, listen, I, I just want to live in this spot, and I want to live as a hobbit. Here's what he had to say about this. Look at this quote. He said, I have realized that I, was all, I have always lived in the Shire. The only thing missing was to become aware of it and build a village. I wanted people to enter my mind, my fantasy. Many make fun of us. Some think I am trying to escape from reality. Far from it. I am living my dream, my adventure. By purchasing that piece of land, I have removed it from a reality that I don't like, and I am shaping it the way that I want. Did you catch that? I'm going to shape reality the way that I want, and I'm going to invite everybody into my fantasy. I will reshape reality into the way that I want it. I just want the world to be the way I want it, and I'm going to make it revolve around me because I'm a hobbit. Now look, if you think that this is some weird isolated incident, it is not. Do you know that people do Lord of the Rings weddings? Look at this. I mean, there are all kinds of people, they will do Lord of the Rings weddings. Google it, I dare you. This is not isolated. This happens a lot. There are Jedi weddings. There are Harry Potter weddings. You can do this every year. We had this in Birmingham. We had Comic-Con. Okay, this is in Birmingham, by the way. That's not in California. That's in Birmingham. I saw at least two of these people at the mall not a month and a half ago. Dragon Con was over in Atlanta a couple weeks ago. And some of y'all are just rolling your eyes. You're going, listen, I just cannot believe this. Who are these people who literally just dress up and they wear weird colors and they get super excited about things that don't ultimately matter? No one would do this. No one would ever do this. How in the world would people get into such a state in their brain where this could be how they become? This would never happen here. To us, would it? Too close to home? I don't, is that either anybody here? Anybody? <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> All right, you can pull that down. That's, that's weird for me to watch. All right, so this is the natural bent in all of us. And look, please understand, there's nothing wrong with these things. There's nothing wrong with Lord of the Rings. I am a fan. I do not own any costumes. Rest assured, all right? I'm also a college football fan. I watched multiple games yesterday, and I enjoyed them, mostly. I mean, look, it, it, there's nothing wrong in these things. The problem comes in when you begin to think that this is the center of the universe and everything revolves around me. And you can do it with anything. You can do it with entertainment. You can do it with sports. You can do it with office politics. You can do it with family drama. You can do it with money. You can do it with neighborhood politics or politics in general. You can pick whatever you want, but there is a tendency inside every human soul to want everything to draw around us and, and what we think should happen and what we want to do. It is the natural tendency of a human soul. When you and I pray the Lord's Prayer, it produces a Copernican shift that recenters the gravity of our universe back where it always should be and actually is where the Lord is the center of the universe and not us. Where we recognize, wait a minute, he's not living in my world, I'm living in his. The world isn't about me, the world's about him. Wait a minute, it's not just about what all I want. It's about what he wants because he's the God who is in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Wait a minute, I'm living in your world, not the other way around. When you and I begin to pray in this manner, when we recognize these things, it recenters us. And we need that. Not every week, every day. Consistently. We need to be reminded of the centrality of who God is. And then thirdly, the Lord's prayer humbles and heals us. The Lord's Prayer humbles and heals us. Right there in the middle, in verse 12, it says, Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. This is always that weird part when you're saying it out loud because you don't know whether you're going to say debts or sins or trespasses. Remember, you, everybody's doing it in unison and you get the blah, 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 right? Because we don't know which word to say. Or they'll even tell you up front, like going, we're going to say the Lord's Prayer, we're going to use trespasses. You know, and like they have to tell you up front, and the problem with that is, is that we get so hung up on the word itself, we forget what it means. 
Because basically what he says is, God, forgive me of my sins today. In the same way that I need to pray for daily bread, I'm going to pray for this daily cleansing, this daily forgiveness. Remember, we're all struggling. We all make mistakes. We are all still in process. Even as believers, even knowing the Lord, even as saved as we are, we are still struggling. And the Lord's prayer forces us to be reminded of that. That we're not okay yet. That our only salvation doesn't come in who we are, what we can produce, or what we can succeed at, or what we can do. It, it comes in the Lord and who He is and what He has done and is doing in me. And so we come to this line which basically says, God, forgive us. Forgive us for what we did, and then we can get specific about that. But that's embarrassing. Even when you know you're not going to be rejected, it is embarrassing to say to the Lord or to somebody else, hey, here's what I've done wrong, so we just don't do it. We just don't do it. It's embarrassing. It's humbling. And nobody likes either of those things. So we just don't do it. We figure, mm, maybe if I just say the right prayer and I say it the right number of times, it'll be good. Maybe if I just do a few more good things, it'll offset and everything will be fine. We'd rather mess with the machine than talk to our Father. And the Lord says, no, if you're going to pray properly, just come to the Lord and say, hey, God, hey, here's, here's my sins, and God, I'm sorry. Would you forgive me? And Lord, I'm going to forgive the people who've also sinned against me because they're no better than me, and I'm no better than them. Uh, God, forgive me for that. And if that feels just undoable for you, go back to that first line. Remember, he's your Father. The God inviting you in is the same God who created you, who pursues you. Listen to who is saying this prayer. It is Jesus himself. Jesus who came, not to the, the best and the brightest. He didn't come to the Pharisees who had finally gotten it right. He says, no, I came to the broken. I came to the sinful. And then I'm going to go to the cross and not say, if you can do this, then maybe you can get in too. He says, no, I'm going to die for you to do what you can't do. I know about all of your sins, and I will die for all of them in me. You can have through my grace a full salvation that you cannot earn and therefore cannot unearn. And when you know that that's the God you're talking to, it makes it a whole lot easier to confess your sins. His grace becomes like a, the anesthetic to the work that he needs to do in our souls daily. The spiritual surgery that he's still working out, revealing to us parts of our, our sin nature and, and working on that and changing it. We can go through that because we recognize that I am never going to be rejected, abandoned, cast out. I have been accepted, though I don't deserve it, by God's grace. And I have an eternal salvation in him. Okay, that frees me to do that. If you don't, well, then we end up rejecting God forgive us our debts, and we reject our Father, and we just tinker with the machine. No wonder prayer seems unfulfilling to us. And so I wonder if before we get to our request, and we're going to get to request, asking is a major part of prayer. They're, they're, they're okay. They're not just okay. They're, they're invited. They're, they're welcome. But before we get there, the Lord's Prayer can teach us the manner in which we should pray. What if we came to the Lord, and before I said anything else about what I would ask, I would simply say, God, you're my Father. Put it in your own words. God, this world is bigger than I am recognizing today. I tend to get all caught up in my, in my own world. God, hallowed be your name. I think my stuff is, is always so great, but look at you. You are so much more amazing than I give you credit for. Wait a minute, your kingdom matters more than the concerns that I have today. Even though I, I know that they're important to me, God, your kingdom is even greater. It's more eternal. God, your will is even better than mine, and you, you always want what's right. Not just right for you, but you want what's right for me, too. You will never lead me into temptation. And so, God, your will is more important. I, I want to recognize all of that and give you praise and honor before I ask for anything. What, would, what if we tried that in our prayers? What if that's how we approach the Lord? So let's do that right now. Just bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment. And we're going to close in worship in just a second. And look, I don't, I don't know what your prayer life is like. And you don't have to tell me. You honestly don't have to tell anybody. You do have to talk to the Lord about it. He has invited you in. 
no matter who you are or where you've been, no matter how long you've drifted, even if you've never known him before, he's still inviting you in. He's inviting you into a relationship with himself. I wonder if some of you are recognizing that you've never had that relationship. And he's offering you salvation through the death and resurrection, the shed blood of Jesus who paid for all your sins and offers you new life in him. What if before we get into all the requests that we have, there's nothing wrong with those requests. What if before we got to those, we simply spend some time with our Father? Not just this morning on Sunday, but, but every time we prayed this week. We say, Lord, I, what, what I need most is you. I need these requests too, but if I got none of them, here's the thing that's non-negotiable. I, I need you. Because you are the center. You are good. You are my Father. Let him speak to us. Change us, move us, mold us. Let's walk that path. And so, Father, hear us as we pray. Hear us as we respond. We choose today to listen, to seek you first in all that we do. Thank you. <laughs> that as we draw near to you, you draw near to us. Would you do that in these moments? In your name we pray. Amen. Stand up with me if you will. Let's worship together.
I think Jesus can appreciate that prayer, don't you? It's honest. That's what the Lord is looking for more than flowery language. He says, can you bring your heart? Can you recognize me? Can you let me draw you closer to myself? Let's let that be the goal this week as we make prayer a priority in your personal prayer life, as you pray with others, as you pray with your family, as you pray in the morning or at night, as we pray together as a community of faith, let's lift that prayer up and see what he will do in us. I cannot wait to see it. So in the name of Jesus Christ, who draws us close, no matter where we've been or how far we've drifted, may we draw close to him this week. May we be persistent May we be consistent. May we seek after him, lifting our eyes to him and seeing him as the center that he truly is. So in the name of Jesus Christ, who does all these things and more as we leave here today, may we all go in peace.